that's one of those rules that a, a character should grow, should change, should be different at the end of the story than at the beginning. And you can certainly write good stories where that happens. But I think about the Maltese Falcon. Bogart's character is the same guy at the end as that he was at the beginning. And he's great. I want to see his next case. <music> Hi, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, you'll get my conversations with peak performing thought leaders, creatives, and entrepreneurs. Every week, I bring you the latest scoop on what these incredible people do to succeed and how you can get their secrets and do it too. And hey, do you want to become a member of the Innovative Virtuoso Club? Our virtuosos get all sorts of exclusive content like bonus episodes just for you and videos to boost creative adrenaline and problem-solving juice. Go to isoldatcom slash virtuoso to learn more. And now, let's get on with the show. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I am super thrilled that you are here, and I am so, so thrilled to have this week's guests on the show. Let me tell you about him. Bill Fitzhugh is the award-winning author of 10 comic and satiric crime novels, all of which I've read and all of which I love. I have to say that first. His debut, Pest Control, was translated into six languages, and the film rights were sold to Warner Brothers, and it was produced as a popular radio show in Germany and as a stage musical in LA. And prior to Human Resources, his most recent novel, Bill published The Exterminator, sort of the sequel to Pest Control. And the New York Times has said that Fitzy was in a league with Carl Hyacin and Elmore Leonard. He's, <laughs> he's a strange and deadly amalgam of screenwriter and comic novelist. This is all true, folks. This is all true. The late, great political humorist Molly Ivan said, Fitzhugh is one seriously funny guy. Also true. A one-time FM rock DJ, he wrote, produced, and hosted Fitzhugh's all-hand mixed vinyl for five years on Sirius XM's Deep Tracks channel. Born and raised in Jackson, Mississippi. Oh, Jackson, not Jackson. I don't know why I said Jackson. Born and raised in Jackson, Mississippi. Fitzhugh lives in LA where he is at work on his next project and one I cannot wait to read. Welcome, Bill. I'm so glad that you're here. Hello, thank you. This is so fabulous. It's funny. We were, we started talking and we were both going, wait, is this rolling? We should be rolling. <laughs> we should be rolling this because we found that we have some similar history and I want to delve into that. But also, I just want to say first, before we go any further, I love your work. I love, love, love it. So thank you I'm, so much. I'm, I'm, it's, it's, you, you can't hear enough of that. Oh, well, and I can't say it enough. My husband actually brought home organ grinders for me 20 some odd years ago and said, you must read this. And I did. And I went, oh, and then I grabbed pest control and have grabbed everything you've read as soon as uh, I've written. I mean, as soon as it comes out, I've read it. So I just adore it. And, well, and I, it, it's, I'm sorry to interrupt. But no, 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 please. Like, if, if I had to do everything over again, the organ grinders, first of all, would not be the first book I would want anyone to read. <laughs> uh, and, and secondly, I would want it later in the, in, in like my third or fourth book. And I would like to edit it again, but, it, <laughs> but other than that, I think it's okay. That's so funny. I don't, I don't know any writer who doesn't want to go back to their earlier work and, and reconstruct it and deconstruct it and edit it and do every, so many things differently. So I'm not surprised you say that, but, but what makes you say that about that book in particular? Because I adore it. Well, uh, pest control, which, by the way, I would leave exactly as it is, even though it's it's got its it has plenty of flaws, uh, and I'm a better writer now than I was then. I think it's it's got its charm, and uh, it, it's it's fine just as it is. But that was based on a screenplay that I had written with a friend of mine, and so the plot was all worked out. The characters were mostly worked out. The 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 novel allowed it to be fleshed out more and let, let me do a lot of research that you don't put in a screenplay. So that's where all the insect stuff came in. Mm -hmm. That was just sort of a, a story in the screenplay. You saw the bugs and stuff, but you didn't see all of the, uh, the insect research that's in the novel mm -hmm. in the screenplay. Um, so it was um, easy to turn into a novel because all, a lot of the work had been done. So The Organ Grinders was the first novel I had written from scratch. Mm. And 
what, and I fell in love with the research, all the xenografting research and, and the biotech research. Um, and I was, I, I was fascinated by it. So I was going to make sure you were fascinated by it too. And here, and it got, so I put too much of it in. Hmm. Uh, I would, I would, so anyway, I, I wrote, uh, like the story, sent it in and, uh, the editor who had, uh, was supposed to work on it then was promoted, not because of she got my book, but she was promoted. Mm. Uh, so she handed it to the next editor mm -hmm. who then promptly moved to into the advertising business. <laughs> so she then hands it off to Tom Dupree. Excuse me. I've got to, I've got to clear my throat. <clears> throat> um, who thought, well, two editors have already worked on this. I, I don't need to do much. Ah. And being uh, a, a rookie at that point, pretty much, I thought, well, look how good I am. They don't really have to, you know, edit much of my stuff. Hmm. But it really, it would benefit from probably 15% of it coming out. Hmm. And, uh, and I would make um, Paul Simon a slightly less Boy Scout kind of a guy. Hmm. But everything else, I believe, Artie, I thought was great fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the baboons the guys hunting the the bad the, the transgenic baboons uh you know it's just weird funny stuff so i i, I like the rest of it but it, it it could it could be trimmed down and, and improved i think hmm. and speaking of that um I, I have a new publisher wants to uh is is going to reissue all of my work and i raised the idea of doing that editing for a new edition so that's a possibility wow well i'm gonna hold on to my tattered copy and i'll get the new one too but okay. yeah I, I mean so much it's really interesting to me so much of your work revolves around people who are uh like some of the characters in the book very environmentally aware and then take that to some extremes uh how does that relate to who you are and what your beliefs are um well let's see uh, I, I normally think of my stories as normal people thrown into abnormal situations. Mm. Uh, Bob Dylan in pest control was just a guy working for a pest control company, uh, and you know, a series of sh uh, of, of uh, things happened that throw him into a very unusual circumstance that he has to deal with. Mm -hmm. Um, and same with uh, with Paul Simon. Well, I, Paul's an environmentalist. He's trying to you know, gather signatures and you know do things. Uh, so, and, and I, I'm not that active. I don't, I don't stand outside grocery stores and try to get people to <laughs> to sign uh, um, petitions. petitions not, right. not that I think there's anything wrong with it. I just I'm I'm, I'm here working. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm looking at covers of the books, trying to think of, am I like that guy? Am I like that guy? Uh, yeah, you know, sort of. I, I, none of the characters, except for their um, professional skills. I mean, I'm not an entomologist, so I don't know all the bug stuff that Bob did. I could look it up and I could fake that I knew it. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the guy in Fender Benders is a writer. You know, so how hard was that? And he's from Mississippi, so yay, that was easy. Mm -hmm. uh, same with Rick Shannon. Um, uh, 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 you know, so yeah, there's a, a lot of, of the stuff for the protagonists that are um, parts of me. And I think it's true for most writers. I mean, I, I hear a lot of writers say that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've written two fiction novels, and it's about a fairy godmother. So probably there's not that much. <laughs> in there, but uh, but but you know, there's there. You're a storyteller, and you started, I assume, young. What what made you want to tell stories? Like you, some of you, it lives in every one of your books, for example. But what made you decide? And I think you were what a you you wrote screenplays really before you started on books. How did how did that happen? What made you say storytelling is the thing I want to do? Um, well, it it was not a conscious thing. I, I the the story that that I tell, um, I, I do remember uh, as a kid, and I don't know what age, you know, ten years old, twelve years old, uh, getting in some sort of trouble, and you know, 
getting sent to my being sent to my room. And while there, uh, and and I was you know I was unjustly sent to my room. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I I wrote the story about you know the the. <laughs> you know, some wild animal that was caged and, but needed to be free because, you know, what his wildness was, you know, the thing he was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I, you know, I, I thought it was great. Um, it, it didn't get me out of the room any sooner. Mm -hmm. after I slipped it under the door to my, my <laughs> bail keeper. <clears throat> uh, but, uh, and, you know, I'm sure that, that was thrown away immediately. Uh, but flash forward, uh, and, and you used to take, aptitude tests uh in in grade school and uh they would show them to you and you could see that you were you know strong in certain areas or weak in certain areas or you knew everything or you were a complete moron or whatever the test showed and mine always showed very high aptitude for um language mm. uh, vocabulary uh retention um things like that and very poorly in math mm. um which continues to this day. Um, but instead of anyone saying, well, let's focus on your strengths, they just said, look, you need to work harder on your math. Hmm. Um, which, you know, was frustrating because I was, I, you know, just terrible at it. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, so, so I, I, I knew, according to the tests, that I had some, some verbal skills. And I just sort of <clears throat> drifted that way without making an effort at some mm -hmm. point, And this, this gets us back to what we were talking about before we started the, the show. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, in high school, when I was, you know, you know, Ding my way through algebra class, mm -hmm. um, the junior achievement program came to, to school and I didn't know much about it. Um, are you familiar? Mm -mm. With junior achievement, okay. So it, business uh, businesses uh, pair up with high school students, and you form little companies, and you elect a president and a vice president and a marketing person, and you know you sort of form a little company and you decide on a product, and somebody sells it, and somebody else does the advertising and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And most of them, I think, make you know ashtrays or potholders or you know stuff, but. One of the companies was uh, sponsored by Lamar Life Insurance Company, and they owned WJDX AM and WZZQ FM, uh -huh. and the biggest radio stations in the state of Mississippi. Right. And everyone listened to ZZQ at that point. Um, so I signed up for that. And some other guys who had done junior achievement a year before that and I didn't know them. They were from a, a public school. I was at a Catholic school. Um, they decided to do a, a, a political show. So we, uh, and for some reason, let me see. I know I don't think I was the host of that. Yeah, I was. Um, anyway, they, so some politician came in and a bunch of numbskull high school students are asking, you know, innocent questions and they're getting pablum back from this guy. And this is airing on a, a rock radio station at mm -hmm. you know, seven o'clock Sunday mornings. And I thought, well, this is this is a terrible idea. So I talked to a few of the other uh, people in the in our company, uh, and decided to stage a uh, a takeover, mm -hmm. which we did. We voted the guys out of office, <laughs> and, and, and we took over and proposed that we write our, our rock and roll biography shows, which I completely wrote and produced. Uh, and my, you know, uh, it, it, and that was great. So that we did like thirteen. Of these half-hour shows, and I was the 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 uh, the host, the voice. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that had me, you know, having to time out segments of songs, uh, and and that, <laughs> I, I got good at math because you know you're working with I don't know is that base six? Yeah, I think it's base six. <laughs> talking about sixty seconds and, and right. so forth. So I was you know, having to calculate you know minutes. Um, and so I, I, you know, and the show weren't great. And then I was hanging out and this is a hundred thousand watt FM radio station reached like seven States in the South. Wow. And uh, so, and it was, I was hanging out with the guys we used to listen to and they were very friendly and they taught me, you know, how to do stuff. And I just, when the series ended, the junior achievement series ended, I just kept showing back up at the radio station every day and the receptionist, <laughs> 
she didn't know not to let me go back there. Wow. And eventually, and this you, you may this may have been true for you too. Um, you know, you just said, "I'll work here for free." And the the management at radio stations probably even to this day will always let someone work for free. Sure. And so I did and hung out and hung out. Finally, they hired me to pay, you know, $2 and 35 cents an hour or whatever the minimum wage was back in 76. And uh, so ended up doing in, during high school, I was doing uh, 10 PM to 2 AM shifts and then going to high schools uh, where my grades couldn't have gotten much worse anyway. Uh, and then ended up staying there after graduating high school and uh, ended up doing the morning show for a while. And then I, so anyway, so that, that's the common thread we have in radio, but that was writing. So I was writing 30 second commercials and 60 second commercials. Then I wrote a, uh, a, a end of the year radio show that was three or four hours. Mm. And then later when, after moving to Seattle, uh, met up with a guy, uh, and we were writing a radio comedy show. So we were writing two and three and four minute sketches <clears throat> then decided wanted to move to Los Angeles to write sitcoms, so there's, that's a move up to 30 minute scripts. Then decided to start writing screenplays, so then you're moving up to two hour scripts. Then adapted a screenplay into a novel. So I just kept writing progressively larger things. Mm -hmm. um, and it was great training to do that. I mean, but, but it was completely, you know, I, I, it wasn't a plan to do it that way. That's just how it worked out. And some of those, some of those formats of writing are very similar, but some are really quite strikingly different. And this, this notion, you know, oh, I wrote a PSA and then I transitioned and then I transitioned again and now I'm writing novels. That is that it, it seems like it's a kind of a meandering path, but I can see how you went from one to the other. What's different for you from writing for radio versus writing a screenplay or a novel? Um, I don't, I don't know that I think of it, uh, you know, with, with radio, you, you want to keep in mind what you can do, uh, orally, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, what sounds you can put in that will tell part of the story in the same way that when you're writing a screenplay, uh, the, the pictures can do some of the work for you. Mm -hmm. The characters will f the, the actors will fill out parts of the characters that you don't, you know, so you don't write a bunch of character description and, and they, he makes this little, uh, he's got this twitch and you know, the actors will do all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you just write, you know, to do the stuff that uh, the cinematographer and the director and the actors aren't going to do. You give them, uh, you know, a blueprint to make a final product with. The screenplay is not a final product. It's, you know, any more than a blueprint is to a house. Mm -hmm. um, with the novel, you do, you've got to do it all. Um, so, uh, so, and, and uh, I think uh, I got a lot of comments about pest control and cross-dressing. Uh, it's like watching a movie. It's like, well, that's because it was originally a screenplay. Mm -hmm. And as I adapted it, I'm doing the stuff that uh, the director and the actor would, I, I'm, I'm giving you all the details that you would see on the screen. Um, uh, I, I, don't, I have no idea if I've gotten close to answering your question. No, it, you, you absolutely have. It is, it's, it is something that fascinates me, though, this idea that when we're reading a book, we get to imagine the world versus when we're watching a movie or a television show, the world is shown to us. The world that the, the director, the cinematographer, the set designer decided to show us is the one we see versus in a book. It's different. So I'm always curious about how a writer navigates those two different worlds. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, the, the writer <clears throat> has to describe uh, the house, the setting, the, the, the whatever, but different people will read the exact same words and imagine something completely different versus if they watch the movie, they're all going to see the same thing. Exactly. And so it's, it's almost a once removed situation when you're writing. So that favor, I, I, I... say that again, I didn't hear you. Go ahead. Uh -oh. Oh, uh -oh. 
Hello. Oh, this is going to be something we edit. <laughs> or maybe not. Are you there? Or I'm here. Uh, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh let I'm gonna do let's see. Can let's try again. Can you hear can me? You, I can hear you just fine. Okay, well, here's hoping I can keep hearing you. Uh it's okay. uh there's there's some I don't know what's going on. I bet you my Glitch. husband. Yeah. Eh, eh. And we would be frozen in time if, if this was video. See, this is, I as I said, I live in Brooklyn, New York, and internet is not always the greatest here. We oh. sometimes have uh, issues, as they say. So anyway, okay. what, what we were talking about, was, it, it is fascinating to me, this idea of, you know, they say, paint me a, paint me a word picture. But as a writer, you do that. And, and I actually, I have a question to ask you that you probably will go, oh, pish, but I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> so when you're studying to be a writer right now they talk about sort of best practices oh don't do a lot of description don't give a lot of exposition let the the dialogue and the action be what holds the day how do you feel about that as as a writer yourself what what do you think about those kinds of rules for writers and how do you either follow or not follow those rules um <coughs> excuse me um uh, you know rules have some, you know, they, they, a pish. <laughs> See? Um, uh, you know, Elmore Leonard's 10 rules are, are fun, are funny, uh, and they, they have some value. Uh, you know, I, I think if you've got, if you've literally, if, if, if you haven't done any, if, if you've been um, working construction, I don't know, and, and I worked construction for a period of time, um, uh, and you've never, you haven't spent years writing, mm -hmm. uh, and you decide, well, I'm going to write a novel. Um, I, you know, it, unless you've read a, a lot of books and have some sense of, you know, the, the different ways there are to put words together, um, you should probably uh, read a lot of books uh, and and maybe look at some. How do you how do you construct a novel? You know, get some idea from people, you know, read Stephen King's on writing. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it, I think it, it, most of it comes from having done just thousands of hours of it. Um, most of which, you know, are not that good, but, you know, you just keep getting better. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's like screenwriting when I was trying to be a screenwriter. Um, and well, you, you, voiceover is terrible. Well, I, you know, you can tick off a long list of great films that have an awful lot of voiceover in them. Sure. Um, now, is is you know, should you try to tell the story without voiceover? Well, you know, if you, if you can, great. But you know, don't don't follow the rules just because somebody said here are the rules. There really are no rules except make it interesting mm -hmm. make make the make the reader or the viewer want to know what happened next absolutely and i love i love that answer and when you were talking about great movies for example with voiceover blade runner comes to mind as one of my favorite movies and obviously voiceover is liberally used but you do sit on the edge of your seat wanting to know what happens next and there's something compelling about being privy to someone's inner monologue if you will what what it is they're actually thinking and it's i guess maybe it's just a little bit voyeuristic when when you write how how do your characters this is a strange question but i'm going to ask it anyway i have a lot of those for you how do mm -hmm. your characters how do you care how do your characters learn because it seems to me sometimes they spend the book some of them, the, the funny ones anyway, they spend the book not learning, but how do they grow? What, what prompts that growth for you in, in the stories that you write? Well, I mean, so that's, that's one of those rules that a, a character should be, uh, should, should grow, should change, should be different at the end of the story than at the beginning. And you can certainly write good stories where that happens. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's like, I think about, you know, uh, the Maltese Falcon. Uh. Well, Bogart's character's the same guy at the end as that he was at the beginning, yep. you know, and, and I, I, he's great. I want to see his next, you know, 
case. Um, so, I mean, my characters, like I said, if, if you just drop a, a normal person into an abnormal situation, uh, you know, they have, and, and they're obviously going to come out the other end of it because otherwise <laughs> that's not very funny. Your protagonist got his head cut off. <laughs> like, well, no, that's a terrible ending. Um, so that, you know, they, they've learned, or I don't know if they've learned, but they've, they've managed, they've coped, they've gotten through some weird situation and, you know, can they, you know, uh, write up uh, a report saying, well, here's what I learned at the end of that. Um, you know, it's, it's like any, you know, live, when you live life, you go through stuff and you've maybe learned some compassion. You've learned something clever. You've, you learned something going through difficult or strange situations. Um, but it's, I, I don't write the stories so that we learn uh, or that we see the lesson that that guy learned. Mm -hmm. they're not it's not really about that it's about well how is he going to get out of this and oh that was pretty clever you know did he learn that or was he already clever but he had never you know he'd just never been faced with a situation where he had to show that he was clever in this one mm -hmm. and I, I, don't, I don't know that i can uh, uh pick you know pull out from the whole story uh, and and here's what he learned I, I don't think I, if, if I really looked at all the stories closely uh, and we don't have time for that, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I, I sort of feel like my characters, uh, well, I, I, this, so, one comes to mind, uh, Dan Steele in cross-dressing mm -hmm. goes from being a thoroughly obsessed, uh, uh, self-absorbed uh, uh, consumer kind of guy he's an advertising executive and he just wants more stuff good stuff the best stuff you know that rare scotch that he can brag about um and through the course of, of, of a series of events he has to learn to care about people and he does you know so so <clears throat> now, now that now that you make me think about it um there's one he changes uh, but I, it seems like most of the characters uh, are you know kind of the same at the end they've just accomplished something during the course of the book interesting I, I when you bring up dan i can i can absolutely see that i i also see paul grows in organ grinders i see rick grows between the two books and and to me i can see that rick has learned a lot a fair amount uh, and he certainly isn't quite as depressed as he was at the, <laughs> at the beginning. Well, that's that's <laughs> you know? fair. But but I I, I didn't. Uh, that just seemed to me that the natural course of the story, <clears throat> um, rather than I'm going to write the story so that this guy learns these or or <clears throat> comes out of his depression into this other thing. That was just the the natural result of. Um, the things that he did right and and that makes sense uh, you know you don't necessarily have to plan out and on page 256 he's going to have this revelation i don't I, right. that's that's sort of that's not what i what i'm thinking about i'm thinking about how it, it is interesting to me that we uh who read your work or someone else's work we analyze what you might have meant whether or not you meant it you know, we, we yeah. might be going, oh, the curtain is blue. What does the blue represent? And, and, and <laughs> yeah. was, you know, a blue curtain. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so having, having said that, a yeah. lot of your books, well, three of them anyway, are about, you know, uh, what is the, the sort of the organ transplant theme, if you will. It, then that's what heart seizure uh, uh, and uh, human organ resources grinders, and organ seizure. grinders. And human resources. Yeah. What, what, uh, what, What's the fascination there? What made you go, I'm going to write about this theme for three books? Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, so that was what we like to refer to as the transplant trilogy <laughs> uh, un I until it. I wrote uh, the, the next book, which is also uh, organ transplant related. So now it's the transplant tetralogy. Wow. I, I had to make sure I had to, oh, I didn't. I was happy to find out there was a word for four works of art, if you'll excuse me calling this art. Um, so yeah, so the next book 
uh, is, well, I'll tell you about that in a second. The answer to your question, um, the organ grinders uh, came about after I read a story about a guy who had AIDS and wanted like a baboon bone marrow transplant to see if that would, because there was some reason to believe that th that would um, mitigate his, his problems. Mm. So he had to uh, petition the FDA and stuff. Uh, and I don't think he ever uh, received the transplant. Um, but the, the word was fascinating, xenografting. I'd never seen that word. And, and so it's, it's uh, the trans, uh, transplantation between different species. <clears throat> And so I looked into the biotechnology and just because of supply and demand, <clears throat> excuse me, something in my throat. Oh, grab a drink of water. I can, <clears throat> I can uh, sing a little ditty if you want, if you I, want to I, go I, grab I, some water. Well, I have the water. It's, <clears throat> that's not helping this get out of it. But anyway, mm. um, so uh, demand exceeds supply for organs. And so there's money to be made. Mm -hmm. So the biotechnology people are saying, all right, let's see if we can figure out how to solve this problem. So anyway, I, I just read all the stuff about organ transplants and the way organs are distributed around the country. And it is fascinating. And while I was writing the organ grinders, I thought, oh, here's a great idea. And that was the idea at the base of heart seizure. Mm -hmm. And then years late, well, so after the organ grinders came out, a, a producer named Trevor Albert, uh, met with me because he wanted to see if you know, we could make a movie, which we couldn't figure out what to do. Um, years later, uh, and, and this showed, you know, after the change in the television landscape allowed for things like The Sopranos and Breaking Bad mm. and that sort of drama, I went back to Trevor and suggested that we try the organ grinders as that sort of a, a, a television series. <clears throat> not exactly the organ grinders, but in, in that world of, you know, the black market for organs and that kind of stuff. And we wrote, uh, I wrote several scripts and we attached, uh, his, his producing partner was uh, James Keach and we attached a, a showrunner from True Blood and we went around Hollywood and nobody bought it. So then I had this other idea that had that, well, this television idea and I turned that into human resources as a novel. Mm -hmm. It was somewhat different than what we had done for the screen. But the, the, the short answer is the, the science of transplantation just keeps coming. It just the, Here's another story. Oh, here's a completely different story than that one. Here's another one. And I'm not going to not do them because, well, you've already done a transplant story. It's like, yeah, but here's another one. And it's really good. Um, and so the next one came about. You know, people, where do you get your ideas? Well, you know, eh, all sorts of places. Year After the organ grinders came out, uh, a playwright by the name of Leonard Gersh, who wrote Butterflies Are Free, among mm. other things, mm -hmm. um, I, was someone who I, I met through a friend of mine. He read it and sent me a, a funny email about, you know, this is great. I think we should, you should turn this into a musical with, with the transgenic baboons and People are singing all these songs. Like I, I left all my parts in San Francisco and love is just around the cornea. And, you know, it was very funny. And then he wrote some lyrics to um, you know, a couple of verses to a song. And I thought it was very funny and I filed it away. Years later, I saw a story about a guy in Georgia who was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease. And so he's going to die. Uh, he says he had a better idea. Why don't, you take all of my organs and I'll die that way. Eight people get to live who would otherwise die. And I don't have to suffocate to death. Well, I, I could never find any um, proof that he uh, tried any actual legal maneuvers. Um, the, the main problem is that uh, absent some sort of uh, uh, um, exemption from the state, a physician wouldn't be allowed to do that because it would be homicide. Right. Um, but I thought that's, that's just a great story, you know, that someone would, you know, offer, you know, would be that altruistic. Um, and since then, several other people have tried, you know, have, have said they wanted to do that as well and have not been allowed. Um, so I merged those two ideas, Leonard's idea about making a musical 
uh, about transplants somehow um, and the story of somebody who's going to die trying to um, donate all of his organs as his means of death. So then California passed uh, AB 15, which is a physician assisted suicide uh, law. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, that's it. Uh, a guy gets diagnosed with, and, and my guy, of course, doesn't just get diagnosed with one terminal disease. He gets two. Uh, so he's got uh, Lou Gehrig's and a glioblastoma, a, a terrible uh, um, brain tumor. Um, and so he's talking to, he's got two friends. One is his doctor. The other is is an attorney. And so they, they realize well, he, he doesn't want to do um, AB 15 because he hasn't accomplished anything in his life. He wants to try to do something before he dies. Then he, they, they say, well, why don't you donate a kidney? Oh, that's a great idea. I'll donate a kidney. And well, why, why don't I donate, you know, everything? I mean, it's a little grad, more gradual than that, but he goes from, can I just donate a kidney to, hey, take everything. And, you know, so they realize he's he signed his, organ donor card and he's on the registry. So he's made a contract with the state where he's legally, um, no one can interfere with his right to donate his organs. He is also, now that AB 15 has passed, legally uh, free to uh, have physician assisted suicide mm -hmm. that no one can interfere with. So these two laws conflict. If you do AB 15, you can't donate your organs because of the way the law is written. You have to do it, uh, uh, you have to be at home uh, and, and take a, a, I think it's secondal, phenobarbital of some sort. Um, and by the time you're pronounced dead and you get to the hospital, your organs aren't viable for the most right. part. So um, they want to go, to, they, so we're going to, you know, we're going to sue the bastards. And so they go to court and, but when the word gets out and the public hears about this, there's a knock at the door and there's this guy, very uh, finely dressed gentleman, uh, Leonard Stratton is his name. He, he says, you know, he's a Broadway producer and he, he's, he wants to make an opera out of this story. Well, okay, more like Les Mis. <laughs> eh, eh, little Shop of Horrors. <laughs> and he's written a bunch of songs. And they keep trying to kick him out, except that the guy, you know, who's dying thinks it's a great idea, you know, if, if if I'm not allowed to do what I want to do, at least if this guy tells my story, you know, I will leave something behind. So they sort of partner up while the legal team is pursuing the court cases. And it's all, I mean, all, all, I, all the legal research is fascinating and it's going on in other parts of the world where, um, well, okay, you know, kidney sales, you know, might not be the worst thing that could happen. And of course, 10 years ago, oh, no, no, you absolutely can't sell your organs. It's going to do nothing but prey on the poor. Um, so it's like, well, you mean if, if a rich guy said he wanted to sell, it would be okay? No. Uh, so anyway, the, the legal stuff is interesting. And in fact, in Canada, uh, a couple of people, several people have been allowed to do this. Hmm. Their, their, their uh, terminal diagnosis, um, they say, no, why don't you take my organs, save some people's lives. I'm going to die anyway. Uh, so it's it's fascinating moral legal stuff, um, and then you've got this guy see, who's written all these crazy songs, uh, and he produces in in the course of the things he produces a, a musical, and we sing the songs throughout uh, um, uh, the book, which I think will be interesting when they do the audio book because wow. it'll, be, it'll actually sing. Um, I love it. But um, yeah, so you took a bunch of. Uh, public domain songs because you know it's cheaper uh and he just rewrote the lyrics mm -hmm. so for example uh, let me find a good one here um uh, well that's a good one well, that's a good one. Oh, i like that one too um so uh <laughs> there's a song the midnight special um so they found him in so they found you in the bathtub just chilling in the ice and on the mirror in lipstick, a note that really wasn't nice said, you better call a doctor and you better do it soon. We took one of your kidneys and we did it with a spoon. I had the midnight surgery up in the motel room. I had the midnight surgery. It weren't no honeymoon. So anyway. Um, <laughs> I love it. 
and and there's another couple of verses and choruses and uh, the, it's just it's ridiculous but it's it's the it's Leonard's Leonard Gersh's idea from 20 years ago about let's turn this into a musical merged with this new story I saw um, and it came out great <laughs> ah that's fabulous when is it when is the book coming out uh, they are going to it's next year uh -huh. um, and so they're going to republish all the books and I think one will be published each month and I, I, I don't know I can't I've got to look at the contract again to see if the four organ books will come out one after another or if they're going to spread them out and if the new book will be in the middle of things or at the end of things I I don't know for sure I don't even know if they know for sure yet hmm. well I but, can't wait I'm gonna to have to update my library <laughs> yes you do oh that's great so okay so you've you've got that you've got you've got music you 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 explore like I can I can sort of look at your body of work and explore the different themes you have explored. What haven't you explored with your books that you want to? Um, <clears throat> you know, I, you know, funny things like the death penalty and um, hilarious. Yeah, you know, it, it strikes me as, and I think by the way, there have been people on death row who have said, look if you're going to execute me why don't you just take all my organs and save eight people's lives because i took a few and you know we'll call it even uh, but they've not been allowed to do that either <laughs> but they, they will be allowed to sue to get a heart transplant before you execute them. Uh, yeah. um, so i don't know i don't really have um some uh area that i boy i've been wanting to do that i i would just go ahead and do it uh if if i could think of something that made me want to do it that much. Mm -hmm. you know? do you, I'm sorry, did, uh, did you finish what you were saying where you cut out just a little bit? If you wanted to do it, you would do it. And then I didn't hear the last thing you said. I think I, th I think I said, yeah. <laughs> that one, rim shot. All right. I love it. So, so do you plan things out? Do you plan your plots out? Are you like a planner or a pantser? What, how, how does that flow for you? Um, I'm more planner uh one two three uh four of the books you know came about uh, they were they were screenplays or teleplays or stage plays first um the the uh, um a perfect harvest is the name of the book that'll be out next year uh and i wrote it as a stage play because it had the songs in it mm -hmm. and I, I didn't know i it didn't occur to me that I could, you know, put that in the book somehow. Um, but after I uh, uh, got this call from this publisher, he said, "Are you working on anything?" And it's like, "Oh yeah, I've got, I've got this novel. I'm working on it." It was really the play, but uh, they they liked the idea. And once I figured out what I did was instead of making it a third person third person omniscient. Uh, a narrator, which all the other books are. I decided to have Leonard, the producer, be the narrator of the book. Hmm. And so he could, you know, and he could start singing his songs. <laughs> um, and he would explain, you know, or after he sings, um, you know, when at work or at play, hear those organ grinders say, have you got any organs today? And he'd go, he, he sings the song. And then afterwards, the lawyer says, isn't that the caissons go marching in? You know, so so you can if you didn't recognize you, you wouldn't recognize the tune until he explained it. Um, you could go back and sing the song to yourself right. instead of just reading it as lines with a rhyme scheme. Um, but so in, with the other ones, he he prefaces you know that song. Um, uh, God rest ye merry gentlemen. You need a nice pink pancreas. My surgeon said to me. Um, the one you got is all but shot on this. We all agree, get on the list and do it now or you'll be history. So if, if you tell people ahead of time what the song is, then they can read the lyrics and they're all the songs or most of the songs are ones that most people will be familiar with. Right. And what was the question? 
<laughs> uh, don't 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 worry about the question. We're on to the next thing. So yeah, and it's it, I really hope that your audiobook narrator for this is also a singer because that they're they're gonna have to be in order to to do that to do it justice. Yeah, no, absolutely, because the guy sings the song. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's phenomenal. So let me uh, let me ask you. You said you know you we were talking about are you a planner or are you a pantser? Oh, that's it. Uh, that, no, no, that's okay. That's okay. As you know, as I said to you before we started this this conversation, where we go is where we go. But I do wonder, um, COVID, how has it affected your writing schedule? Or do you do you have one? Do you? I I'm like Hemingway. I wake up in the morning and I write 800 words no matter what. Or is there a different style to which you're accustomed? Uh, no, I, I you know like it. Well, it depends on how um, enthused I am about whatever I'm writing. Um, and I, I think it also has, has, has changed over time. Uh, early in my career, I was very excited that I was able, you know, that I was being paid to do this. And I was constantly thinking about it as I went to sleep. I would wake up early, you know, get in here and get to work. Um, as I've gotten more experienced, it's like I, I don't, I'll come in here with coffee and read the news and think, yeah, I need to get to work. And then I'll get to work. I mean, I, I like to try to work on it every day. Um, uh, and sometimes you'll just get in a, a, a groove and just work, work, work. Sometimes it's like, eh, it's just not happening. I'll write a few bad things and I'll go walk the dogs. Um, with with uh, this book, which happened to coincide pretty much the beginning of, of the, uh, the quarantine, um, it kind of worked good. It gave me something to do while staying safe. And now that you don't have to go to a library to do any research, actually, well, I mean, I, I've got four accordion files about you know, nearly a foot thick each, probably nine inches thick each, with all this organ related research that I've done through all these organ related books. Um, so, uh, you know, in addition to whatever I need to find online, I've just got tons of stuff in my files. So I could stay here, uh, work, you know, a little bit every day or all of, you know, some days. <clears throat> and um, it really helped. And, and I, I think I did it in five months, which is probably the fastest I've written a novel so uh, it yeah it didn't it I, I you know you, you can't run the experiment twice i don't know how i would have written this in normal times mm -hmm. right? sure yeah it, it, it <clears throat> is and and i have to wonder how people who are creative how creative people's work is going to be affected by these last six months you know we can't can can we ignore it can we what what is it going to do to the to the body of work that's being developed or has been created now over these last six months and into the new future? I find that uh, something that that sort of I noodle around a lot because I talk a lot to creative people and a lot of people like you have gotten things many things done and a lot of people are going I can't even put my fingers on the keyboard because I'm just so stressed or overwhelmed or whatever. So right. I'm glad I'm glad that you were writing more more books for me to read, which is great. But but that leads me to the next question. And that is what do you read? Oh, uh, I'll answer that in just a second. But I was I would, as you were talking, I, I, I did, it, you know, early on, wrote to my the publisher and said, so are we uh, incorporating or ignoring COVID in this mm. book? Mm -hmm. Um, and he said, well, you know, that comes up a lot with my <laughs> people who are writing books for us. Uh, and he, we decided to ignore it, that um, it, there was just no, there were no upsides to it. Mm -hmm. It was it was a layer that wasn't intended for the story. And while you could do it, uh, it would it would not be helpful to the story. And. Uh, so anyway, uh, that that <clears throat> that came up, and I think it, I, know, I know it's come up with other writers I know. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, it's no, we're just going to write it in in a normal world. There's you know will no doubt be uh, plenty of uh, COVID stories told, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, there's that. I just finished reading a book called Astral Weeks. Um, uh, like, and uh, there's a long subtitle, the secret, some, the secret story of something, something, something. <clears throat> and it's set in Boston in the late sixties, early seventies. And it's, uh, fascinating. Uh, uh, Van Morrison was in Boston and he was, you know, he, that's where he wrote, uh, the early parts of his famous album, Astral Weeks. Mm -hmm. And all this stuff, I just had, I, I didn't know that he was ever in Boston, let alone that that's where that got started. And, but it, it branches off into a whole, a, a lot of other weird stuff that was going on with Jim Queskin's jug band and um, uh, of the, something called the Fort Hill community, which is this commune in Boston that had this uh, a, a guy named Mel Lyman, who was sort of a messianic and uh, sort of a cult leader. And it was just, it was fascinating, uh, an underground newspaper. Uh, and so, you know, I was young in six, well, I was, what was I, uh, 10, 11 years old in 1968. And I was in Jackson, Mississippi, not in a big city like Boston, but we had a little underground newspaper uh, and you knew about cults. Um, mm -hmm. So reading about all this stuff, was, was, that was interesting. I just started reading Parnell Hall's new book, Chasing Jack. Mm. Um, I've also got John Bilheimer's a uh, book, Hitchcock and the Censors, um, which is about just what you'd think it would be about. Uh, uh, Alfred Hitchcock navigating the code Hayes, uh, the Hayes Code, mm -hmm. uh, and how he managed, <clears throat> he would, you know, write stuff into his screenplays that had to be approved by you know, this, the, the code people. So he would put in stuff that he didn't really want, but he knew they would want to take it out and he would use that as a bargaining chip to keep something else in. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so the, I think those are the three. So yeah, just finished the Astral Weeks, just started Parnell's book and I sort of pick up uh, John's book because it's not fiction. It's not a, an ongoing story. I can pick up and read about how did he deal with rear window? You know? mm. So I, that's, I periodically pick that up and read a little bit more. Uh, I, don't read as, I don't read as much crime fiction. I guess Parnell's book will be, um, you know, a crime book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I used to read a lot more crime fiction than I do, but I'm, uh, I'm and now very curious about, I'm a huge Hitchcock fan, so I'm very curious about, uh, about the book you're talking about. I, I love the idea that he was anchoring, it's a ne typical negotiation tactic, you know, I'm going to anchor this. I'm going to tell you that for you, this candy bar is going to be, right. you know, it's normally $57, but for you, it's going to be 30. Oh, okay. I'll take the $30 candy bar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And I, I was willing to settle for 22. Right. Exactly. And, and, and so he did it good for, good for him in that way, at least. That, yeah, but, and, and John's, John's a terrific writer. Uh, I like his, his uh, crime novels that are set in West Virginia coal country. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the research he did on this uh, was fascinating, in-depth, thorough, uh, I saw him at, we always, we always have a dinner, uh, at the, um, the book conventions, Bowser Khan or Left Coast Crime. And we were at Left Coast Crime in, uh, uh, Reno several years ago when he was telling me about this and I was like, couldn't wait, couldn't wait. And it finally came out. So yay. <laughs> I love when a book that you really, really want is finally, you can finally get it in your hot little hands. Let me, yeah. I, I, I want to pivot. I know, I don't want to keep you too long because I know you have a life to get back to and uh, Not I really. keep you. Oh, okay. Well then let's talk. Uh, so I, I do want to ask you about the business of writing. How do you navigate the business of writing versus the creative aspects of writing? Um, well, you, first of all, you hope there will be some business. <laughs> <laughs> True. And sometimes you have to try to, you know, make some business, which means you work on spec. Um, but that's, I mean, I guess I had always, <clears throat> after radio, um, uh, when it was, you're here in Los Angeles, you want to write sitcoms, you've got to write sample scripts. You've got to write those spec scripts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, and nobody's paying you for it. And after they read one or two and they don't like those, you, you've got a choice of either keep shopping those around, which is a bad idea because people have already read them, uh, words out that those scripts aren't any good. Uh, and you're not writing anymore and you're not getting any better at it. 
so you've got to, you know, motivate to keep doing that, you know, so that you can drum up some business. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, once, once, once you, if, if you drum business up, it's a lot easier to go find an agent then <laughs> because, oh, I've already got 10% waiting for me. Great. I'll sign you. <laughs> and literally, I was living on Radford Avenue in Studio City. Uh, and right down the street in the same uh, um, uh, address block as uh, the CBS studios where Roseanne and a bunch of other shows were being shot at the time. Mm-hmm. And I sent my uh, a spec script into an agency and uh, followed up with the, uh, the receptionist. So I learned that lesson, um, you know, never try to, you know, get past the receptionist you know, because you're not important. I need to talk to the important guy. Treat the receptionist as the most important person in the world because they're at the gate. Right. They, they can let you in or not. So she read the script, uh, liked it, passed it on. <clears throat> she put me through to Stu Robinson, the, the uh, one of the um, primary agents at Robinson Wine Trap Gross, who said, oh, this is, I love the script. I see you're over there on the lot. You know, why don't you come in and we'll talk? He thought based on my address on the script page, the cover page of the script, that I was already working at a show on CBS. So he Ah. was automatically going to get a commission. (laughs) I love it. That's the only reason I'm pretty sure uh, that that I got in. And so, but, you know, once you've got it, if you have an agent, then the business part, you know, that's their problem. I mean, you can um, talk about, you know, what the negotiations are. Shouldn't we ask for this? Can we get that? Um, So, you know, but, and and then having said all that and had agents for most of my books, um, the last, the the deal that I signed with um, Farago who will be publishing all the books next year. You know, I've got enough contracts around here from large and small publishers that I can compare and look at the, the royalty rates, the um, how did you get the reversion of rights? Can we change the language here? Can we delete this paragraph? And I just, you know, did that myself. Um, so, I mean, and, and, and along the way, mistakes were made. <laughs> not not for that contract, but, uh, you know, it, it, with ha- having written a screenplay with someone that had we sold it, we would have split 50-50. Then I turned, I spent a year turning them into novels, which we then sold the film rights to. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, we had the same, the, a lawyer representing the, us as a team uh, do, writing the contract up. And so, you know, it's like, well, you know, a little bit of a conflict of interest when the rights are being sold to the book that I wrote based on the story that we had come up with together, there should have been a, somewhat of a carve out for the work I did to m- do the adaptation from which those rights that we were originally trying to exploit were finally sold. I, I'm sure that doesn't make sense if you just hear me say that. Um, but, you know, live and learn. It's navigating all of that confuses me, even if I did understand exactly what you said. I was still confused. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's it's hard because for so many people, this idea of an agent, that you don't get an agent until you actually don't need an agent anymore, it, it seems to be pervasive. That Well, uh, you know, I... I Actually, I mean, the TV story, you know, uh, was, it's, it's funny just because it's sort of like, yeah, that's, that's an agent for you. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, with, uh, with the books, you know, I, I had no idea what to do. And then I read a book, well, you write query letters and here's a, you can buy a list of, of all the literary agents in New York for $10. And I did. And I wrote a query letter. It was probably too long, but I thought it was funny. Um, and sent it out to 10 agents and decided that every time I got a rejection back, I would send out two more queries. Mm -hmm. And after 125, 130 rejections, 
somebody finally said, oh, this, this is hysterical. I, you know, I want to be your agent. And I, boy, did I need one because you, at that point, there was no way one of any of the big houses were going to read my manuscript. I was just, I didn't, you know, yeah. Who do you, you don't know, have, you have no idea who to go to. Right. That's what the agent does. The agent knows they're looking for this. They're looking for something else. This is the perfect person to send it to. Um, so, uh, you know, Jim, Jimmy Vines, who was my agent, who, you know, sort of made my entire career. Um, you know, I, I needed him. <laughs> he was great. Oh, and that's, that's wonderful. It's wonderful to have someone who thinks your work is hilarious and believes in it enough to really, to really push for it, which, which, uh, you know, I'm glad, you know, for all our sake who, who get to read your work, I'm, I'm, I'm super glad. But what I'm, I'm wondering if a new writer came to you and said, what would you tell me about, I want to write full time? What would you say? Uh, well, I just did this. Um, somebody, a friend of my brother's um, has finished a novel. And so we talked and, you know, all, you know, there's nothing you can do. It's like, you've written the book. Congratulations. Um, now you've got a, you know, you've got choice, you get different choices than I had when I was starting because there was self-publishing then was you pay somebody to, to print the book up right. or, or you went to Kinko's and you made copies and you bound it yourself. Um, now you can, you know, print, you know, you can publish a very good looking print on demand book through Amazon. Right. Um, along with 10 million other people and nobody knows about it because everybody else is screaming, read my book, right. listen, listen to my album, look at my new film that I made on my telephone. Um, so the, you know, good news and bad news. You can get worldwide distribution. Unfortunately, no one in the world knows you're doing it. Right. Um, but you know, if, so all you can do is send those query letters out to agents and, you know, be aware that there are smaller publishers, you, you know, while it's nice if Simon and Schuster wants to publish your book and buy end caps and, and do online marketing, odds are against that happening. Um, but all you can do is pursue it. Um, you just got to keep knocking on doors and ignore the, the, the people who reject you because that doesn't do you any good. The rejection doesn't help and, and worrying about the rejection doesn't help. Just not go to the next door, knock on that one. And, you know, just keep going as long as you believe that it's worth, you know, that this is a good piece of work. It's, you know, somebody's going to want this. And, you know, I mean, nobody wants to, you know, <laughs> I think mainly what people want. And I know I did when I spoke with writers and whether they were TV or screenwriters or, or novelists, I wanted them to say, here's what you do. Right. <laughs> oh, here's the secret. <laughs> here's, there's, there's, yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you an email. It's easy. Everybody, you know, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't exist. You just, there, you know, I, you know, I, people, when I see people, I've had 27 rejections from agents. It's like, oh, you're just barely getting started then. Right. <laughs> And I'm sorry, but it's just not, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not easy. Yeah. Call me when you've get, gotten to 200 rejections, then we'll talk, right? <laughs> sure. I'll even talk to you at 150. <laughs> I love it. So, so, okay. I want to, I want to, that, that makes all sorts of sense. And yet you keep, you, you keep doing it. And it's not just the agent, right? Some of it is social media. Some of it is other things. What do you do as an author to engage your audience, to engage new people, to engage the people like me who are waiting for your next book? What do you, what do you do? Uh, not probably not as much as I should. Uh, I tried uh, Twitter for a while and just, I didn't get it. And it, it the, the, the amount of time that some people spend uh, on various platforms to promote themselves is an amount of time that they could be writing something really good. Mm. Uh, I, I, the stories I've heard about 
you know, this person who was rejected by agents and publishers and then, you know, published something through Amazon and is, you know, posts, you know, some ungodly number of things per day, per platform. It's like, well, you, when, when are you writing the next book and how good is that going to be? Comes to mind. Mm -hmm. I, you know, so I'm on Facebook and periodically I will say something about, oh, you know, my book, Heart Seizure, is similar to this news story that came out. Mm -hmm. But I, I really haven't actively promoted, uh, you know, well, except when, say, Human Resources came out and I reached out to 25, and I hate that phrase, I can't believe I used it, reached out. Um, <laughs> I got in touch with, you know, 25 or 30 writer friends. And, and instead of asking them for a blurb on the book, I asked, I said, I'm going to send you a, you know, a one, two, three page section of the book. I want you to blurb that. So I'm not taking up much of your time. It's a, a different approach to doing it. And it would give me 30 blurbs. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, you can be insulting. You can be funny. You can be like, you know, whatever you want. And then for 30 days on my Facebook feed, I would post you know, the blurb with the cover of the new book and so forth. So, you know, that, that was my idea of, of a clever um, internet marketing, social media marketing program. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I may have sold two or three of those books. <laughs> I, have no idea. I don't, I don't, I didn't even, I don't even keep track of it. It's like, yeah, I've, I've done the work. It's good. Uh, the good news is uh, having established myself to whatever degree I've established myself, um, people might, go searching Amazon for, to see if I've done something new. Mm -hmm. um, because it's, it's so hard to push media into people's lives. Everything now is pull. Um, if I'm curious about whether, <clears throat> this is maybe not a good example, of whether Carl Hyacinth has written a new novel, I can go look for it. If I find it, I can pull it into my life. Turns out he's with, you know, Simon and Schuster or some, you know, I forget who he's with, but uh, my feed is full of his ads for his new book, right. which I, I look forward to reading. Um, <clears throat> but I, I'm at least established enough because I was with a big house for 10, 15 years that people might go looking for my work on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's just no way I could afford a, a serious um, ad campaign online or anywhere else. Um, so, um, what was the question? <laughs> you've, you've answered it. It's what, oh, what, what, what do you do to engage your audience? And, yeah. and it's, and it's interesting because people like me, I, I, you know, I follow you on Facebook, so I will see when a new book is coming out or we can go to your website or something like that. You know, speaking of which that's billfitzhugh.com so that you, if you're listening to this, can go to Bill's website and find his amazing books. But, uh, but also this idea of engaging an audience, I feel like it's, it's a little strange to ask it this way because we don't spend time in bookstores, sadly, anymore. Right. Right. But, but I remember when, when Rich, when my husband first brought home organ grinders, he was working at uh, USA Today at the time, and it was on the slush pile. And he said, Isolde, you need to read this. And I started reading it. And then I immediately went to my closest borders books and sat down with pest control and then went, okay, I guess I have to buy it because I've now read half the book sitting on the floor in the <laughs> store. So so that that is what ended up happening. That's how I got to you. You know, I, I read Organ Grinders, loved it, and then immediately went and found pest control. And that idea of the first page, the first two pages, you start reading one of your books, Hyacinth's books do, do similar. Like you've been saying, you put normal people in abnormal circumstances, but it's not just abnormal. It's ratcheted up. There's never a uh, status quo in your book for, for any of your books for very long. Things just keep happening and it's engaging because I wanted to know what kind of wacky thing would happen next. And so the question I'm asking now is not just how do you engage an audience social media in 2020, but how do you engage them with your writing? What is it that you are doing? Are you just telling the story or is there a more purposeful 
I'm going to keep ratcheting it up so that you stay around to see what happens next. Uh, and, and I think the, the real answer is I'm, I've got to amuse myself. <laughs> I love it. Um, because I, th I, I think if, if I think it's funny and interesting that you should too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and for some people that will be true for other people, you know, you can, I've got plenty of one star reviews, <laughs> you know, hmm. and for whatever reason, you know, some books just don't appeal to some people. There's nothing you can do about it. Right. So I, I, I write it just because the story has to do certain things uh, to, in order to achieve its storiness. Um, uh, <laughs> and, and, and I've got to be interested and I'm, I'm, I've got this research I've got to get from a this point A to point Z here. And since I'm supposed to be a comic novelist, I think it better be funny. Mm -hmm. uh, and periodically, and but you can't keep it funny like at the top of a roller coaster the whole time. You've got to bring it down, and there's there are some normal moments. There might be a sad thing here and there, um, but yeah. So so it's it's mostly I'm entertaining myself. Um, but and here's something that's that, that'll be depressing for writers um, in terms of uh, trying to reach an audience these days. Uh, I had, you know, because of radioactivity, I was, I was doing a book tour and I was in DC and I got invited to, uh, XM. They weren't merged with Sirius yet mm -hmm. to do some, uh, um, interviews and publicity for, um, I guess it was Fender Benders actually that I was, I was promoting at the time. So I was on, I was on one of their country channels. Um, but I met a guy named George Taylor Morris, who was the program director for the Deep Tracks channel. Mm -hmm. And we talked and I had a background in FM rock radio and I knew what they were doing. I wasn't a subscriber yet. Um, but then I, you know, one thing led to another and I ended up with a, a half hour show for five years on the deep tracks channel. And um, so I was, you know, able, I, I didn't use it completely as a platform to talk about me and my books. It was about the, the music that was in the show, but I was always able to say, you know, I, I write novels, you can go to my website. And so I was able to promote my website and my books on Amazon on a nationally, you know, satellite delivered radio show to who knows how many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm not sure you could really tell from the sales that I had that sort of a platform. <laughs> so just all of which goes to show it's like, it is hard to get anybody to pay attention to uh, you, your new book, your new record, your new movie, your new TV show, when there are so many of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but you, so, so you can either quit or n understand that that's the world you're living in and keep doing what you're doing. And amen to that, because that idea of you better believe in it and you better love it because you're going to be doing a lot of it. <laughs> It's and, really, and, it's important. And you might not be getting much in return. Yeah. It, well, it's so much of this, so much of creative work is for the love of the game. And yet it would be so nice if the writer got paid for writing and the, you know, the painter got paid for painting. Right. But, and yeah. and it, another thing to keep in mind is what can come about only because you did the work. And then, you know, I, I got an email one day from an attorney in New York who said, yeah, I've been trying to reach your agent. And this, by the way, is the, the end of the, the other end of, of the Jimmy Vine story who, you know, made me something out of nothing. And then years later stopped returning everybody's phone calls, uh, including the calls from people who were wanting to buy various ancillary rights to books. He just decided to retire, but didn't tell anybody. Oh, wow. So anyway, I get this email from this attorney in New York saying, I've got a client who wants to produce uh, a play based on one of your books. And it turned out to be he wanted to make a musical out of pest control, which is like, well, <laughs> you know, I thought about the film rights because it was a screenplay to begin with, but it never crossed my mind that someone would want to make a play, let alone a musical out of this thing. But only because I had written the book and stuck through 125 agent rejections that some guy read the book, happened to be the son of a wealthy man 
who then comes into some money of his own, decides he wants to be a, a Broadway producer and picks my book out of all the books in the world to make a musical. And it ended up being staged in Los Angeles. I um, love it. I, I, nobody was pursuing this. Right. It's only because it was out there that, uh, that they, you know, they came to me. And the same is true with this Farrago. I wasn't trying to, you know, sell my backlist to anyone. Mm-hmm. I wasn't, you know, writing a new novel until they called up and said, hey, you know, we know about your books. We'd like to republish all of them. And are you working on something? Uh, yeah. But all of that happened only because I had sat here for decades in a room writing books. And you have to. I mean, yeah, that's... I mean, that- that, I mean, that's what it is, right? If, you, if you're if you a natural storyteller, which I believe you are, you can't help but tell stories. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's just that, I, I guess my point was more that you, you sometimes will be rewarded for work with rewards you had never anticipated. Sure. I anticipated the possibility of getting receiving a very small amount of money for a book mm-hmm. that would be fantastic then it turned out to be a, a a large amount for the film rights to the book and then publishing rights and then the stage rights out of nowhere and then somebody from germany wants to turn it into a radio show well I, you know i didn't pursue that it's only because somebody else i did the work and then somebody else saw oh i want to turn this into something else right so you know with, with Without doing the work, none of those things are going to happen. Yeah, and, and and that's exactly what I meant. That you were you were telling your stories. You were you were writing the books you were writing. The other stuff you didn't necessarily pursue, except for because you had the body of work. Somebody else could come up with the idea and and right. then talk to you about it. Which I you know that's that's phenomenal. I lo- I love I love that's such a testimonial to you know sit in the room and but you know what they say but put put your butt in the seat and do the work so and 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 i i actually walk when i write but (laughs) but that's similar so i i'm gonna i I know as i said i want to be cognizant of your time but i have just a couple more questions if that's okay sure uh what are you curious about right now what are you most interested in exploring um in terms of um writing in terms of whatever, what I, I, I am always curious about what, what, what is it that you're going, huh, I wonder what, or I wonder why, and it doesn't have to be about writing. If you're curious about something, I'm always interested in how, how your mind works. What makes you go, oh, I want to know more about this. Well, it's hard uh, for me, at least, not to be pretty focused on politics right now. Mm. Um, and, you know, uh, just, you know, uh, hard to put words to it. It's, you know, been such a fire hose of insanity mm-hmm. and, you know, you know, in, in all sorts of things, I mean, the, the, the black lives matter thing reminds me because I'm from Mississippi, maybe more the, the, the opposition from some people reminds me of nothing so much as opposition to the civil rights movement, Mm -hmm. Um, which, you know, years later, it's like, oh my God, you know, how how, um, how, how dumb you look now having, you know, opposed with such vehemence that these citizens, you know, get some rights. Right. Not taking any rights from you. You're just opposed to them getting some. Right. And that's, that's what B, the BLM just, you know, you know, you live long enough, you see this stuff happen again. Um, and, you know, of course, the, you know, uh, the, the current administration. Um, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm obviously curious, you know, can Biden Harris beat the current, you know, uh, people um, whose name I just can't seem to get out of my mouth. Um, I can't uh, either. And you know, what, you know, what's going to happen? Will there be any um, justice on the other end for some, what, a, you know, by all accounts are illegal activities? Or will it be like, no, well, we need to let the nation heal. 
Mm -hmm. and no one's really going to be held to account. Um, you know, and, and, and these are, you know, much bigger things in their, you know, than, than writing, you know, a book um, and have, you know, larger uh, consequences for larger numbers of people. So uh, it's kind of, I mean, now that I've finished uh, the, the book and, and, and the publisher loved it, uh, I do still owe them a, um, a short story. So I'm, I'm just, and it's got to be about insects because it's, it's, it's a giveaway short story to their mailing list to sort of prime them for pest control and the exterminators. So I've got to write that. And I've got like 20 little pieces of story, character, and plot that don't really turn into anything yet. So I've got, I've got to get that done. Um, but, you know, in the meanwhile, I'm, I'm, you know, sending postcards to, you know, swing state voters, mm -hmm. trying to, you know, get stuff, get something accomplished. And uh, uh, so that's part, you know, and, and, and other, other than just, you know, daily everybody's life stuff, which, you know, what's for dinner? I've got to go grocery shop, you know, <laughs> I'm going to do all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> I, I will say, um, uh, and this goes back to some earlier question. Um, I, I have the, uh, people that say, what, what, what's the one piece of advice you would give to a, a, a writer? And uh, my answer is always, you should marry well. <laughs> it, because it's only because my wife worked very hard uh, and allowed me to, I mean, she, uh, just, she, she agreed to marry me when I wasn't worth a nickel. But she, you know, she, she, you know, I even cook. Um, so, and, and I've got a job, so he's, he's nice to have around. So, I, you know, I was allowed to do all this work. Um, where a lot of people don't have that luxury. Right. Um, if, if I had, was putting in 40, 50 hours a week doing something, uh, I probably would have just come home and, and watch basketball and drink beer. Um, but I was, you know, allowed i had the luxury of <clears throat> being you know given the time to write and wasn't going to squander that and i didn't so i mean <clears throat> i i got lucky in that regard <clears throat> and, and, there, and and luck is a big part of of all of this you know i was lucky that i happened to find jimmy vines in fact jimmy vines wasn't on the list of agents it was another agent on the list who turned me down, but said he knew somebody who had just opened an agency that I queried Jimmy Vine. For, so that was just luck. You know, it was luck that Jimmy sent the book to a film scout for Warner Brothers who happened to love it. That person could not have loved it. Uh, so just, and, and then their boss could have not loved it, et cetera. It said just so, just so many things are out of your, you haven't, you can't make someone like your work it's just kind of luck that somebody does mm -hmm. and they're in the position to do something with it and that's how it, all the only thing you've got in your control is writing the book mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and writing it to the best of your ability it, it's funny what you just said reminded <laughs> me of a, a lyric from the musical pippin and that is it's smarter to be lucky than it's lucky to be smart <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, I, in fact, I, I wrote a whole speech in <clears throat> um, uh, A Perfect Harvest where the producer is r ruminating on, on luck. And, you know, and th there's the, 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 the phrase, you know, luck favors the prepared. Mm -hmm. And there's a famous story of, of uh, an attorney um, who said, oh, yeah, you know, it's all about luck. And I, I usually find that luck happens at three in the morning when I'm in the library doing research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you're when you're when you still have your butt in your seat and you're doing the work when you're still doing the work <laughs> yeah. yeah it's only yeah. because of that yeah yeah and and, and sage advice for sure <laughs> i <laughs> and marry well it's true that's that's what my husband and i have trouble with is that we're both artists <laughs> <laughs> so so you know we we're gonna have to rely on our cats to uh to support us in our old age uh <laughs>
<laughs> so oh, I, I, I have, I'm so grateful to you, Bill, for joining me for this terrific conversation. And I'm, I, as I said, I could, I could probably ask you 44 more thousand questions, but I will, I will stop with one last one. Um, well, before I do though, is there anything else that you would want? Uh, I know BillFitzHugh.com is your social and a perfect harvest is going to be coming out next year, along with your whole body of work, which I'm so excited about. Is there anything else that you want to say uh, about things that you, that you have coming up before I ask you my last question? Uh, boy, let's think. Uh, no, nothing comes to mind. Okay, that was easy. So I asked this question of everybody who's on the show, and it's a silly little question, but it's one that I find often brings up really fascinating answers. And the mm -hmm. question is this, if you had a plane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? <laughs> Marry well. <laughs> I mean, that's just good advice. Uh, my, uh, a, a good friend of mine from uh, Mississippi, uh, Jill Connor Brown, wrote a series of books uh, about the sweet potato queens. Uh, and they are hysterical. They're, uh, they're, uh, they're funny. They're, they're heartwarming. They're, uh, they're, they're great. Um, and they have some, uh, some funny recipes, many involving bacon and chocolate. Um, but one of the, the points she makes um, in, in her books uh, is, I think, something her father used to say to her, which was, be particular. Mm. And it's just great advice. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it doesn't matter, you know, what you're talking about, mm -hmm. um, whether you're at the grocery store and it's like, you know, you're looking at the vegetables. Well, you don't want that bell pepper with the, the bad bruise. Be particular. Get that good one. Right. Uh, when you're, you know, looking at uh, uh, who you're going to get married to, eh, be particular. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I might, with her permission, I might skywrite be particular. <laughs> That's great. Mary Well, be particular. I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, there are variations on the theme. <laughs> yeah, I think I think they serve each other for sure. Well, Bill, again, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And I I'm sure that my entire audience is going to be running out and buying the books, especially when the new the new whole new set comes out. I'm really grateful to you for being here. Well, it's my pleasure, Zola. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, so much fun. So much fun. If you enjoyed today's episode, you absolutely know that you need to go to BillFitzHugh.com, find out all about this phenomenal man and amazing writer. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I am so grateful that you joined me for this show. If you're liking what you're hearing, please rate it, review it, tell your friends, subscribe. You know the drill. Until next time, this is Isolde once again telling you to remember to listen, learn, laugh, and love a whole lot. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Today's episode was produced by Zolda Trachtenberg and is copyright 2020. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, this is Zolda Trachtenberg and I send you all of my love.